Now, I, I think there are still better ways to code this, but I'll leave fixing that as a problem for someone else. This is good enough for me. Thanks, Tom. I'll take it from here. Tom's FizzBuzz video is excellent in showcasing how to make bad code, or write code, and I'll write code good code. But he stops there. So let's finish what he has started and see how we can make your code outstanding just by implementing one basic programming concept. In case you haven't seen Tom Scott's video about the Fizz Buzz Challenge, here is a breakdown. A common way to test if a programmer can think ahead and produce easily readable and maintainable code is by giving them a problem such as the Fizz Buzz Challenge. The rules are simple. The program goes through numbers 1 to 100. If the number is divisible by 3, it prints fizz. If it is divisible by 5, it prints buzz. If it is divisible by both, it prints fizz buzz. Otherwise, it prints the number itself. Tom then proceeded to go through a few ways of approaching this task. His first solution was well below anything even a beginner programmer would even consider writing, using a whole series of unnecessary checks to test whether the number was divisible by 3 but not 5, divisible by 5 but not 3, divisible by both, and divisible by neither. He then rearranged his code, and this is probably what most non-professional people would write, as it seems to be the straightforward solution. We check if the number is divisible by 3 and 5, if not we check if it is divisible by 3, if not we check if it is divisible by 5, if still not we print the number. This code works and it looks alright, but as Tom points out, but To me this is still dodgy. Because if someone says, okay, now we want it to work on multiples of seven, not five, and, and that's a common sort of follow-up question for something like this, you have to remember to change all the fives. Not a big problem in a section of code this small, but once you start working on something big, this is really bad practice. Ideally, you shouldn't run the same test twice. He then presents his final solution, whereby each loop starts with an empty string. If the number is divisible by three, we add fizz to it. If it is divisible by 5, we add buzz to it, and if the string remained empty at the end, we print the number. This approach is neat, clear and easily adaptable, giving us a lot of room for making changes easily. However, Tom continues by saying, Now, I, I think there are still better ways to code this, particularly if you wanted to plan long into the future. After all, those lines there, I'm technically repeating myself, but I'll leave fixing that as a problem for someone else. This is good enough for me. So let's see how we can make this code even better. There are a couple of problems here. First, as Tom mentions, big chunks of the code are the same, but also making changes still involves looking into the main bit of code, having to know how it works, and making changes directly to the loop itself. Essentially, the issue is that the logic and the rule set are bound together. It's much better to abstract the problem and hide the logic from future users, so they don't have to worry about it, having to only focus on the rule set itself, which is the most likely to need change. So a better way to approach this is by splitting the two from each other. So let's start from scratch. First of all, we always work in a function, so this is where we will write the logic for the game. This function will take the rule set as a parameter, and regardless of what the rules are, the function will work the problem all the same. Now that we declared the function, we should write the rule set itself, so we will know how to construct the logic. We can write the rule set as a series of objects in an array. This way, we have a single, variable, clearly understandable rules and a very simple way to adapt the code. Anyone coming in to make changes will only have to look at this variable and not worry about anything else. While we are making our code adaptable, we might as well define the upper limit of our loop, so we can easily change it from 100. With the rule set clear to us, we can work on the logic. Now, just as Tom did, we can loop 100 times, but in this case, we use the limit key to determine the number of loops. Now, all we need to focus on when changing the upper limit is the value declared in the rule set. The for loop will adjust accordingly. We can then declare the output variable as an empty string. We will now have to iterate through the rule set to check for the number and word pairs in question. We can now use a single if statement, which looks similar to Tom's code, but we replace the hard-coded number and word pair with the one declared in the rule set. This means we can use a single if statement for any number of potential rules. We can have as many or as few setups in our preset as we wish. The loop will ensure to check through all of them and the if statement will match the correct words to the correct numbers.
The final step is the same as Tom's, checking if the string is empty and assigning i to it, if it is. If we check the code, it works exactly the same way. The difference is, we can now collapse the function and make any change we wish to the rule set alone in a clear and simple manner and the code will work just the same. All you need to push your code to the next level is applying some of the basic elements of computational thinking, decomposing the problem into two smaller parts and abstracting it by hiding irrelevant sections from future users. This will instantly boost the quality of your code, making it easier for others and yourself to work on large projects. If you can think of a better solution, you can write it in the comment section.